Hello everybody, today we are going to be going through and looking at all of the hearth cards. Now, let's just get straight into this, I'm sure you guys know the rundown by now. Hearth, unlike some of these other folks we've been looking at, care about three things and all of their cards stay in line with those three things, and those are flow stuff, breaking tiles, and rooting stuff. Every single card from this focus does at least one of those three things, or cares about one of those three things. So, let's start off here. First, we got Cold Stone. So, for three mana, you're getting 200 damage, you're getting two flow, and on flow cast, you're also casting a Frostbolt. Now, assuming you're able to take advantage of the Frost from the Frostbolt, this is doing a little under 300 damage if you manage to flow cast it. Plus, it has essentially double synergies going on. Like, this is taking synergy from not only your flow stuff, but also your Frost stuff. And it just so happens that Flow and Frost are two of the most supported archetypes in the game. And they tend to play together pretty nicely because Frost Flow is a common artifact. You tend to see it quite a bit. You can sometimes pick it up really early in a run. And when that happens, it becomes really attractive to go for that kind of deck. To go for the Frost Flow deck. And Cold Stone just kind of happens to mesh really well into that kind of deck because it's pooling off all your synergies from all your flow stuff and your frost stuff. So, so this is essentially double dipping off your artifacts. This is a really solid spell. The rate, 3 mana for 200 damage isn't the best, but if you're flow casting it, you're looking at almost 300 damage for 3 mana, and that's that's a, a really good rate. Like, that's way above average. So, I recommend pretty much always take this if you're running any kind of flow synergy at all. If you're running some frost synergy already, you might want to speculate on this and move more towards the frost flow build. And if you're running neither of those, it's debatable that Cold Stone could actually be strong enough that you might just take it anyway because it it really pushes you towards those strategies. By itself, it's not terrible, but you can take the Cold Stone and then try to play towards it. Kind of like uh, some of the gateway cards for our strategies I've mentioned. This is kind of like that, except it's just such a versatile card that's pulling out of so many artifacts, it's insane. And that's what really pushes Cold Stone over the edge. The fact that it's getting synergy off of both your Frost and your Flow artifacts. Next up we got Earth Prayer. So, Earth Prayer is kind of like glue to a Flow deck. When you're in the early to mid game and you're starting to get some Flow stuff that's starting to go on, but you're not consistently getting those flow casts. You have to really pay attention to your cast order and that kind of stuff. You find Earth Prayer, and it's like it, it just glues all your flow stuff together because four flow is a huge deal. That's usually assuming that there's not a ton of stuff in your deck that's conflicting with your flow synergies. Four flow is going to get you through your whole deck with flow cast up pretty much the whole time. And if you already have flow, it's restoring four mana. So if you're already deeply invested into the flow strategy, this is like an almost... It's almost as powerful as mana fusion 
and on top of that it's giving you all this flow so when you're starting to get your footing in a flow strategy this helps you ensure that you're getting your flow casts and then once you're more deeply invested into it it's paying you off for investing its flow by acting as almost mana fusion which uh, as we discuss in the convergence video I think is a very very powerful card so that being said if you're not already investing into flow stuff stay away from this because it's just two mana do nothing in that case but if you are going towards the flow strategy or already deeply invested into it this is a great card always take in those cases earthworm uh, this is this is definitely not my favorite and I think that's the general consensus so there's a lot of problems with this card firstly it's breaking stuff on your side of the field that's not the best and it can't hit the back row you need to channel it so you need to stand there and if the enemy moves during the cast it's just kinda awful because it's just gonna miss then it's breaking the tile on their side of the field as well but I don't know if this is a good considerations make but you broke the tile so now if they move off the tile and say it's the kind of enemy that would have moved off that tile then moved back onto it guess what they're not moving back onto it because it's broken now for two mana trying to make this thing work is just it's just too much of a hassle there's too many specific things that need to go right to make this good that's not worth it sure it can be okay if you have some spell power stuff going on but there are just much better cards for that that don't require you to stand in place and the enemy has to stand in place too and it breaks stuff on your side of the field and it can't even hit every enemy tile overall I'd just stay away from this one it's more of a gimmick card in my opinion Next up we got Earthen Armor. So, 0 mana for 40 shield and 2 flow is great, but it cracks adjacent tiles, which is not great. This is kind of a card that you can take, and it can be good, but you need to be very careful with it. Breaking anything on your side of the field, and unless you have wings, like if you have wings, then yeah, go ahead and take this, it's really good. But in the normal circumstance, Breaking stuff on your side of the field is kind of a no-no in a lot of fights because it's just going to get in the way. How worth wild is to gain 40 shield and 2 flow in exchange for breaking these tiles is debatable, but you have to remember, like if those broken tiles are getting you hit at all, even once, suddenly this card's bad. So, really, this one's kind of hard to judge. It can be good, you can make this work very well, but you have to be careful with it, and you have to be conscious of where you're using it and what's doing to your side of the field. So, if you're newer to the game, I would stay away from this period pretty much. If you're a bit more experienced, go ahead and experiment with this. It's one of those cards that is good. Like, it's a good card, but it can really punish you if you make even the slightest mistake with it. So, take it if you're confident, and when you do take it, be very careful with it. Next up, we got Entangle. The first of our root cards here. So, for one mana, we're doing 20 damage and cone, and 
rooting stuff in the cone for three seconds. This, obviously we're not here for the damage, we're here for the roots. This is a bit trickier to take advantage of than you might think. It's a bit harder to land than some of the other root stuff we're going to be taking a look at in a second. But overall, if you're really looking for root, this is a perfectly acceptable place to get it. However, if you're not looking to root enemies, this card's kind of eh. I mean, if you want the root, take it. If you don't want the root, stay away from it, is pretty much what I'm getting at here. And that's kind of going to be the case with a lot of these root cards. Next up we got Excavate. Oh boy, uh, this one starts in the Break Terra loadout, and it's another one that I think you would be best served just leaving it there. Because when you're not playing Break Terra, this card is completely useless by itself. You would need some other stuff to break tiles with. And a lot of stuff cracks tiles, which isn't nearly as reliable as just straight up breaking them. So, if you can manage to high roll on this, it can do a lot of damage for one mana. But it's the kind of card where it's a payoff for investing into a, a tile breaking strategy. But, ultimately, unless you already have the means to make this work, i.e. you're playing Break Terra, you stay away from Excavate, because Tile Breaking, in my opinion, is kind of a, a low-tier strategy. It's usually inherently risky. It's unreliable. You have cards that are breaking tiles, but they don't really do much by themselves, and then you have payoff cards like this, but the payoff cards don't do anything by themselves, so you have to put it all together, and the end result is usually just mediocrity. So, unless you're playing Break Terra, in which case you start with this, I would avoid it. Okay, so Fissure... Crack all tiles in front, push enemies aside, and gain 2 flow. 2 mana for 80 damage is not a great rate, but it's okay, it's passable. Cracking all tiles in front, keep in mind that this will include tiles on your side of the field if you're standing anywhere but the front column. And you're gaining 2 flow. So, this is kind of a dangerous card for the same reason that Earthen Armor is kind of dangerous, and really, I would avoid it unless you can take advantage of at least two parts of the ability. If you can take advantage of the flow and cracking tiles, take it. If you can take advantage of the cracking and pushing enemies aside, take it. And if you can take advantage of the flow and the enemy movement, take it. But if you can only take advantage of one of these three things, I would avoid it. And really, that's kind of where I stand on it. It's kind of hard to explain why. But really, it comes down to efficiency. If this costs 1 mana, it might be worthwhile, but at 2 mana, we need to be getting decent, decent payoff out of these effects for this to be worthwhile, especially since it's a card that brings a little bit of inherent risk with it. So, yeah, take this if you can use at least two of these abilities. Definitely take it if you can use all three to your advantage. Next up we got Flat Earth. This one is kind of in the same vein as Excavate, except it repairs the tiles, which does open up some possibilities. 
there are some cards that are usually kind of eh that suddenly become really good if you have flat earth. But the problem here is you're only taking flat earth if you already have something that makes it really good. But you're only taking those cards that make this really good if you already have flat earth. So it's kind of like a catch-22 where you would need to take this card that's completely terrible by itself and just hope, just hope that you find the specific card that you need to make this good. Except a lot of times it's not going to work out. So... Again, this is another one that's going to be strong on Break Terra because she has the means to actually take advantage of this effect. But even on her, because you want the tiles to stay broken, because that's where you're getting your mana region from, I don't know, it's kind of a weird one. It, it's a card where there are a lot of two-card combos with it that can be really good. But the sequencing of the card picks is the problem. Because you're never going to have a guarantee if you take Flat Earth. You're going to find something really good with it. And if you find something that's really good with Flat Earth, but crappy otherwise, there's no guarantee you're ever going to find Flat Earth. So it's that's kind of the problem with this card. It's only good in two card combos, but all the cards that it combos well with are bad by themselves. Okay, next up we got Flint Shot. This one's pretty straightforward. If you have flow and you cast this, you don't lose 40 damage on it. 2 mana for 200 damage is a very strong rate. This is another one of the cards that becomes very, very powerful. If you can manage to find it with 2 times damage and consume, because then you don't even have to worry about the flow, because it's it, it won't stay in your deck long enough for that to matter anyway. And then the mana efficiency here is really good too. Mana for 200 damage is a well above average rate. If you're playing a flow deck though, even then you might want to keep in mind that this is still ticking down your flow counters because this doesn't give flow, it just cares about whether you have flow or not. So, take it if it has two times damage and consume. Take it if you have excess flow that you need to spend somewhere. And how good is this if neither of those are true? The thing is, if you don't get the on-flow ability with this, then the first shot takes a damage reduction before it hits, so it's only doing 160 damage the first time. In that case, I don't think it's super worth it, especially given that 160 damage for 2 mana is slightly above average, I want to say, but then the second time through the deck, this just becomes trash. So... Take it if you have excess flow, take it if there's a double damage upgrade on it, otherwise, I wouldn't bother. Fracture. So, one mana on flow, you double cast, and it gives you two flow. This is kind of the, the most basic bread and butter flow card. For one mana, if you don't have flow, doing 70 damages... About average, I want to say. Uh, it's about average for these projectile type cards, at least. Uh, keep in mind that when I'm saying some amount of damage is average, or below average, or above average, I am specifically referring to the type of damage we can expect from similar cards. So I, I'm not going to compare something like Fracture to something like Entangle, because they're they're just two completely different cards, or I'm not going to compare Fracture to, uh, I don't know, what's a good example? I'm not going to compare Fracture to Thunder, because 
they're just two different kinds of attacks. It's a lot more reasonable to compare something like Fracture to a card like, let's see, like Mana Steel or Sarah Cannon, because those are also projectiles. So keep that in mind when I say that about these damage numbers. But yeah, one mana for 70 damage is about average. And average damage on a projectile, it's giving you two flow. That's already slightly above average, I want to say. But if you do manage to flow cast this, it's doing 140 damage for one mana, which is incredibly above rate. And you're still getting that two flow. So this is kind of like... It's... It's the bread and butter card for most flow decks. It's pretty straightforward. There's not a whole lot to say about it. If you're already having some flow synergies going on, definitely take it. If you have a reason to want to get some flow synergies going on, take it. So the question becomes, do you take this if you have no flow whatsoever? Do you take this and speculate on it? You can. It, it kind of depends on you, I think. Like, if you decide, hey, how about I try out flow strategy deck this time around, then sure, go ahead and take Fracture. That's a great starting point. Because it's about average without the flow cast, but with the flow cast, it's very, very good. Ion Cannon. I don't like this card. Uh, it looks good on paper, but in practice, it's just... It just doesn't perform as well as you would like it to. So it's hitting the four sensor tiles of the Emmy Field and cracking them. It's two mana for her damage in an AoE, it's hitting near instantly, so if you get the setup right, it's kind of hard to miss. This is about slightly below rate from what you would expect. At 2 mana, with this kind of effect, the problem is that it can only ever hit these four specific tiles. So if you have enemies that are stationary and they're not on those tiles in the first place, guess what? You're never hitting with this. Or, or bosses that like to sit in the back row or where, like, this is only hitting 25% of the enemy field. And it's the same 25% every single time. So, if we assume against single enemy this is only landing... 25% of the time, suddenly this card becomes pretty awful. It's just too unreliable. It's the kind of card where you would think, oh, well, I don't have to aim it, so it's it must be alright. But the problem is, because you can't aim it, most of the time it's just dead. It... Yeah, it's just a dead card way too often for me to consider it anything but kind of bad. I would stay away from this one. It looks a lot better than it actually is. Uh, the cracking tiles is kind of irrelevant here because that effect has the same problem as the rest of the card. It's only ever hitting these four specific tiles. Next up we got Mistletoe. So, this is another one of the root cards. This one only roots for one second, except it has a higher damage rate than the rest of root cards. So, we're shooting these missiles, and they're going to go for the closest target. It's going to do 120 damage total if you hit with all of them. If the first one hits, you're pretty much guaranteed to land all of them. Problem with this is that a lot of times it's just gonna whiff. Like the enemies you really want to root, 
like Celacy or Shiso, the ones that move around a lot, this is just going to whiff on because they move too much for this to land. It's just going to miss all the shots. Against the... And even if it does hit, I think you're better served using one of the other root cards that roots for three seconds because the reason you're taking these cards isn't for the damage. We're taking them so that we can root the enemy which will let us hit with a with a more damage focused spell that we're guaranteed to hit at that point. This is kind of it, it doesn't know what it wants to do. It doesn't know what it wants to be. It's kind of in this weird twilight zone where it, it kind of wants to be a root spell, but it kind of wants to be a damage spell too, and it just can't make up its mind. So if you just want damage, I wouldn't bother with this. If you just want root, there are better options. I, that's really the problem with this card. It doesn't do anything well. It, it's like a jack of no trades. There are way better cards for damage. There are way better cards with rooting. So really, I would just figure out what you need and pick spells that are more geared towards that. Not this thing. It's just not good enough. So, Orbital Beam. Uh, this is in the Shiso starting loadout. This card is a thing. It's kind of a difficult to use card. We're firing beams four tiles away, they break the tiles. Now this has a little bit of cast time, so if you move during the cast time, it's going to hit different tiles and break those as well. 40 times 4 damage for 2 mana is a pretty good rate. Because, I mean, it just is. For this kind of effect, 160 damage at 2 mana is a good rate. The problem is actually landing this. Because if the enemy moves while you're casting it, it sucks. If you move while you're casting this, sometimes it sucks. The tile breaking is... Eh, like, even if you have tile synergies going on, I think this card's just too clunky to make sense. Really, this is one that just exists to be in Shiso's starting loadout. Where, if you're really good with his starting loadout, you can do some nice stuff with it, like use a line to force enemies into it. But this isn't a card I ever really pick. The damage is good, but the card's just too clunky to justify it. Next up, we got Prophecy. This is, uh, this is a card. A card that I recommend staying away from for the most part. Unless you have a really, really good reason to be breaking these tiles. Just don't. This thing is far too dangerous for you to take on its own. Like, this is the kind of card you want to take with Flat Earth. And it kind of plays more into a problem with Flat Earth, where trying to use this card without any payoffs is just a horrendous idea. Because what this is doing is, firstly, you have no control over which row of tiles this is going to break. Then, six seconds later, when this lands, you better not be standing there, because if you are, it's going to hit you for 200 damage. And that's just obviously terrible. And then it breaks those tiles. So, 50% of the time, you're only going to have two rows that... Or, no, 50% of the time, you're going to be locked out 
of a quarter of your field. The other 50% of the time, you're going to be locked out of half your field because it's going to be in one of the center two rows, and you can't cross that over to the other row. And if you screw up your positioning, it's possible that you can end up with just one row to work with because this will lock you into a corner. Additionally, actually landing this thing is just up to luck. There's really nothing you can do to help this thing hit because you have no control over what it's going to do. Really, this is the kind of card I would stay far, far away from unless you have a very, very good reason to pick it. It's just way too risky and the odds that this actually does something useful are very, very low compared to the risk factor. Next up we got Rock Cycle. So one mana on flow, return to your deck and it anchors you. This is... This is kind of a hard one to talk about because there's people who swear by this card and there's people who just stay away from it. I tend to stay away from this card because I think there are just better things you can be doing with your mana. So, really, Rock Cycle is the kind of card that you want to base a strategy around. If you can upgrade this and get flow on it, essentially undoing the nerf to it, it's... Pretty good then, because you can just cast this indefinitely. But then we have to ask ourselves, how good is spending 1 mana on 60 damage in the first place? It's slightly below rate. Slightly below rate, and this anchors you, so then you have to get rid of the anchor. And then you've already spent 3 upgrades on this thing, assuming you got lucky and got the upgrades you needed just to make this worth investing further into but then you need even more upgrades to invest into it it's just kind of card that demands you do all this bull to invest into it and in the end the payoff is just one mana 60 damage spells and indefinitely that's not that good. That's kind of mediocre, in fact. Really, if you want to try this, if you want to make it work, and force it to work, you can. But really, I personally don't bother with this, because there's just too many hoops to jump through once again. Next up, we got Rock Tomb. 4 mana for 100 times 4 damage, which is an insane raise. Fires missiles at random enemies. It gives them 3 shield when they hit. And on flow, it pierces shield. And you gain 2 flow. So, this is one of the big payoffs for picking up a flow strategy. And even if you're not in a flow deck, this is going to do... 240 damage for 8 mana. Of course, it's hitting random enemies, which isn't the best. But, assuming you are able to flow cast this, let's look at what it's doing then. It fires missiles at random enemies, so they can whiff a lot of time if you're against a boss that moves kind of quick. But then you're getting 100 times 4 damage off of this since it's piercing the shield. Keep in mind that this is piercing any shield the enemy would have had already, which is making it a lot better. Then you're getting 2 flows, so really the big thing here is just the rate. The rate of mana spent to damage dealt is very high on this card and it's going to just chunk bosses it's going to shred room fights 
And the other thing is this is a big multi-hitting card, meaning that some of the upgrades you can get on this are kind of absurd. Like there's one upgrade you can get on this where it gives you plus four shots and adds a jam to your deck. That upgrade's ridiculous because then you're essentially doing 800 damage. And upgrade on this. If you're already in a flow strategy, take it for sure. If you're thinking you maybe want to go for a flow strategy, take it. If you have no idea what you're doing and this shows up, you might want to consider taking it and then trying to force flow to work around it. It's just that powerful. The amount of damage this card does is well well worth the mana investment and the deck building cost. So yeah, definitely take this one pretty highly. Of course, uh, it's not deck agnostic. If you don't have the flow cast, it's really just average, I would say. But if you do have the flow cast, then th this just shreds. Sword Row. Another root spell. This one costs two mana, and it makes a line of swords that root the enemies for three seconds when they touch them. And I believe the swords last for three seconds as well. Uh, the damage here is kind of negligible. It's not what we're here for. So I would say that this, if all you're interested in is having something to help you root the enemies, this is probably your best bet. Because even if this doesn't hit, those swords are still going to be sitting there for three seconds, so there's still a good chance the enemies are going to move into them and get rooted regardless. So there, there's not a whole lot to say about this one. Uh, the damage rate is obviously terrible, but that's not why you're here. If you're looking for something to help you root stuff so you can land other things, this is a very solid choice. Swords of Light is kind of similar to Sword Row, except I think it's not quite as good. The damage rate's the same. The swords work the same way, but the swords are hanging in random spots. And that's kind of what gets me on this one. Really, the analysis is the same as Sword Row, except Sword Row is more consistent than Swords of Light, so I would generally take Sword Row over Swords of Light. If you want to take both of these, then it kind of seems like a lot of root, unless you're running a really big deck, then sure, maybe you can take these both and be happy with them. But generally, I would just take one or the other. I prefer Sword Row, but if I really need something to help me lock enemies in place and Swords of Light shows up first, then yeah, I'll take Swords of Light. Because they're two very comparable cards. The only real difference is the consistency. Tile Fire. I don't care for this card. It's... Gaining you two flow and dealing 120 damage with projectiles in the rows above and below you. And it's breaking those tiles. If this didn't break the tiles, this would be a really, really good card. But it does break the tiles. Well, it wouldn't be a really, really good card because the damage rate isn't that good. It's... Uh, I'd say it's slightly below average on the damage rate. Assuming you're only hitting with one of these. Hitting with both, it gets a lot better, but that's a really tough situation to set up, unless you're against like the gate or something. But getting two flow, great, cool. You're in hearth, it's in hearth, so there's a lot of stuff around here that cares about that. But breaking these tiles is what really kills this card, because it's. Breaking these specific two tiles above and below you 
is really, really detrimental. Just because of where to position. It's hard to explain, but they're... It, it's a lot worse than breaking tiles, say, in front of and behind you. Though it's kind of hard to explain why. Really, I wouldn't bother with this card. The detriment is way too much to justify the rest of the card. The rate's just okay. The two flows nice, but breaking these tiles kills the card straight up. So just avoid this. Next up we got Tremor. So, 1 mana for her 40 damage and for Jactile. This is a spectacular rate. It's kind of in the same ballpark as Fracture. If you're flow casting, these cards are remarkably similar. Except Tremor, if you're not flow casting it, that's where the difference comes in. Because you're getting... The damage either way, the punishment for not flow casting this is cracking tiles around you. Now, one mana for her 40 damage, if you can get two times damage and consume on this, even if you don't have flow, it's probably worth taking, even though you're cracking in tiles, because that's a lot of damage for one mana. But if you do have flow cast, this thing becomes quite a bit more interesting. Because it opens up some opportunities to combo with other cards since it's repairing adjacent house no matter what. Some things to note, if you get double cast on this, if you don't move while you're double casting it, it'll always fix the adjacent tiles. This is... Kind of hard to pull off, but it can be really good against Terra because you can use it to fix the tile she breaks. And usually, if you can do that, standing in those spots is going to allow you to just avoid her attacks entirely. And you can combo it with stuff like Earthen Armor, where you cast the Earthen Armor, then immediately follow up with Tremor so that you fix. The tiles around you from the earth and armor either way. Really, I think this card may be in the same ballpark as Fracture. It's a little bit riskier if you don't have the flow stuff, but it has a little bit more utility if you do have it. So it's kind of another... It's on the same level as Fracture. These are... Really, your two bread and butter flow cards. Waterfall. So, this used to be a double lift card, and then they removed the anchor and moved it to hearth. So, it doesn't have an anchor anymore. If I it fires a shot four tiles away for every flow stack you have, and it, and it gives you one flow on hit. Now, the one flow on hit is what really pushes this card over the edge. If you only have like, say, three flow stacks, this is doing 120 damage for two mana if you manage to hit it all. Now, that's not that good, and actually hitting all the shots from Waterfall, especially when you have, like, five plus flow stacks, can be quite a tall order, because odds are a lot of enemies are going to move while you're doing this, which is going to make it more difficult to land. Because the more flow stacks you have, the longer you need to cast this thing. Fortunately, it no longer anchors you, which is a huge deal. But what really pushes this card over the edge is the gain flow on hit. So, say you have 8 flow stacks already, you cast this, and you hit with 6 of them. So, you gain 6 flow stacks, you lose 1 from the cast, now you have 13 flow stacks. So this is kind of a scaling card. The longer you go, assuming you can keep on hitting with Waterfall, the higher and higher your flow stacks get. So the more and more damage Waterfall does. If you're not in a dedicated flow strategy, of 
course, stay away from it. If you are in that kind of strategy, this is a pretty big payoff. Like, this is the end point for the flow deck. Like, this is what you're striving to achieve. At the end of the day, when your flow deck all comes together, you're looking to get that waterfall off. Because the waterfall is like the ultimate payoff for going down the flow route. If you're kind of in the mid game and you're not quite there on your flow deck yet, I would still take this just to have it, even though it's not going to be very good yet. And finally, we have Wreath. The last card from Hearth. This one is going to be like Ring of Fire, except instead of putting down flames, it's rooting enemies. I think that this is significantly better than Entangle, and it might even be better than Sword Row and Swords of Light, because it costs less mana. So, really, again... There's not much to say about this one. It does zero damage, actually, so it does less damage than the rest of the stuff, but the rest of the stuff doesn't really do much damage in the first place, so that doesn't really matter. But really, yeah, if you're just looking to root stuff, you, you really want a tool that's going to help you lock enemies in place. This will get the job done, and that's kind of the theme with these four cards here, Entangle, Sword Row, Swords of Light, and Wreath. If you're just looking for a tool that's going to help you lock enemies in place, any of these cards will do. Just take whichever one comes first, and you can figure it out. I do have thoughts on which ones are slightly better or slightly worse than the others, but for the most part, they're pretty comparable. So yeah, take this if you want the root. That's kind of self-explanatory, though. So that's all the Hearth cards. Next time we're going to go through Hexawan, which is one that I'm not looking forward to at all. But yeah, Hearth is a pretty... Like, they really know what they're trying to do. You got flow stuff, you got root stuff, you got break stuff. And that's every card from this focus. There are a few more cards that give flow in Kinesis. But I don't really have much else to say about Hearth. They're kind of one of the less crazy focuses. Like, There's nothing too insane going on with any of these cards. There, there are some really good cards, there are some atrocious cards, and there, there's a lot of just average cards. A lot of middle-of-the-road stuff here. So, yeah, next time we're going to go over Hexawan. I'll see you guys then.